Welcome to my interview with Christopher Kemp, author of Floating Gold, A Natural and Unnatural History of Ambergris. Published by the University of Chicago Press way back in 2011. Still available wherever good books are sold. Christopher has a master's degree in epidemiology and currently works at Michigan State University as a research technician and lab manager in their neurosciences department. Clearly, the guy is pretty smart. He joins me from his home in Western Michigan. Christopher, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with me. I, I'm, I'm excited, yeah. So a couple questions for you, maybe starting off. What is ambergris? Where does it come from and how is it produced? That, those are big questions. And the first thing I, I have to stop you, amber, it's ambergris. Ambergris, okay. Or, or ambergris, depending on where you are, but you definitely pronounce that last S. You, um, um, you went with the French and, uh, and I did too. And that was one of the first things that, that I struggled with when I first heard of ambergris. So ambergris. Okay, what is it? It is, um, well, it's, it's unique. It's, it's its own thing. There's nothing else like it. Uh, I would say that it's most like um, dung. It's most like dung, but it's not, it's not quite dung. You know, I mean, that's one of the great um, areas of confusion about ambergris over the centuries is that it's been thought of as poop, but it's also been thought of as whale vomit, vomit, basically. But it's poop, uh, a type of pathological poop that's made by sperm whales, and only a very small percentage of them. So I think the, the estimates are maybe 1% to 2% of sperm whales produce it. So that's, that's where it comes from. It comes from a, the back end of a sperm whale. Um, and it's a type of poop that is made by the sperm whale uh, as a result of indigestion, basically. So um, sperm whales are a lot like ruminants, like, um, like cows that have um, like a, a series of stomachs, one after the other. Uh -huh. And in a normal, healthy, functioning sperm whale, they're eating enormous amounts of squid every day, up to a ton of squid. And they, they take these deep dives below the surface and they travel up to a mile below the, the ocean surface. And to maintain that enormous size, that, that immense body weight, they're just taking in enormous amounts of squid. And squid is, um, you know, it's very soft and easy to break down, but it, it has this beak it looks a lot like a like a like a parrot's beak almost it's very hard and durable and uh, in a normal healthy sperm whale those non-digestible beaks are sort of regurgitated out now that is that is whale vomit but they're regurgitated out in the ocean and mm -hmm. the and the whale goes on about its way but there is this small percentage mm -hmm. of whales where those non-digestible beaks make it through the stomachs into the small intestine. And there you can imagine the small intestine is very sort of delicate, soft lining. Um, it starts to get irritated and chafed by the, by the beaks. And so that's where the ambergris starts to be manufactured. The gut lining starts to make this cholesterol rich sort of fatty secretion that binds up all the squid beaks and sort of protects the gut lining. So that essentially is, is ambergris. Now there are still mysteries uh, such as how does it get out? You know, does it just form these layers this until it's this big, concretion, this enormous boulder that blocks the gut and kills the whale, or in other cases, does it, does it sort of stay small enough that the whale can pass it naturally, like poop, and sort of feel relieved and, and, and carry on living and being a, a normal whale? So that's not known. You know, there's, there's some, one of the things that really drew me to the subject is that the the fact that in this modern age where we can, you know, 
put a little buggy on Mars, we still don't know so much about the life of a sperm whale, even though we share the planet with it. So, um, so that's what is ambergris and how is it made? So, and you, you touched on this just briefly here. Uh, I'd like to kind of delve into it a little more is you, you came to this topic, not as a perfumer or an ambergris hunter, a dealer, uh, a perfume fan. What sparked your interest in ambergris? That's a really good question. I mean, I am um, just an interested person, right? I, um, I, I, I really read widely. I'm a scientist. I'm, a, um, I'm a, a trained biologist. And so I grew up learning everything that I could about the natural world. And um, back in 2008, I moved to New Zealand. And it was the first time I'd ever lived close to the ocean. I've always lived sort of in pretty landlocked places and, and grew up right in the very middle of England, where it's hard to just even sort of take a day trip to the, to the ocean. And so for the first time ever, I was so close to the beach that my wife and I would just take daily walks, you know, we'd, and you'd just, you look at the, just that high tide line. And it's just for someone who hasn't spent a lot of time around about, about the ocean, it's just treasures, all of it, every uh -huh. tiny little turret shell and every sort of weird bottle that has been washed ashore and you can pick it up and think, where the heck did that come from? And uh, so we were living in New Zealand and there was a story on the, on the evening news about this mystery object that had washed ashore in, uh, in Wellington, which is the capital city. And it was this enormous white sort of gooey boulder. And that was interesting enough, but the really interesting part of the, of the news story was that people were hacking at it with shovels and filling pillowcases with it and putting it into, into plastic bags and then taking it off home because they thought that it was ambergris. And I just had never heard of ambergris or it was, it was one of those words that sort of seems oddly familiar <laughs> but you just don't know what it is. I, yeah. I kept on thinking verdigris, verdigris, ambergris, ambergris, had no idea what it was. So it's one of those things where I'm walking on the beach every day and I'm thinking I could have walked past that and these people are going crazy for it. So um, I think I Googled it and there was just almost nothing on it at all. There's a lot more on it now. And I think partly because of uh, the interest of people like you and the book and some magazine articles out there too, but there was almost nothing on it. And the information that was there was really contradictory. There was a lot of stuff about it being vomit, um, a lot of confusion about what it looked like, what it smelled like, how you might identify it. And so I, I, I think it's fair to say that I wrote the book just sort of by accident, really. I mean, I, started to m write a lot of notes and do a lot of research and go back through sort of the historical record and try to piece together what it actually was and really try to um, really properly conduct a search so that I would find it myself. Uh -huh. um, and before I knew it, I'd written, I'd written half a book. Uh, and so then I just felt a sort of obligation to try and finish it as a as a writing exercise as much as anything else because you know I'm sort of a scientist journalist I try to sort of keep those two ideas aloft and this this really sort of seemed to satisfy both of those parts of me one thing that and you alluded to it uh, just a moment ago was the fact that the the scientific scientific or scholarly information around ambergris is slim to none um why is that? I mean, it's, um, it's not, uh, yeah, so it's not quite slim to none. I mean, you know, science, like anything else, has to be funded. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to wonder where the money comes from for these things. So I work in, in science uh, studying 
neurodegenerative diseases. So it's obvious where the money comes from for that. It comes from governments and other funding bodies that want us to fix this problem. But for something like ambergris, which is just uh, unpredictable, you can't guarantee finding it. In some parts of the world, it's illegal to even trade. In some parts of the world, it's illegal to even pick up technically. Um, so where's the money coming from for anybody to research it? I mean, so there has been research done on manufacturing synthetic alternatives uh -huh. because there's, you know, there's some financial reason for doing that. But I think that's one large part of it is like who benefits from finding out more about ambergris and who is going to put the money into an endeavor like that. Uh -huh. And in a perfect world, like if you go back two or 300 years when a lot of the most wacky and interesting um, scholarly articles were being written on it, it was, it was a gentleman scientist who was interested in it just because things are interesting. But that's just, I don't think that's just not how the world works anymore, which is a, which is a huge shame. But um, I think that's why we don't know more. It's, a, it's actually a frustration really because I can see ways that we could research ambergris um, and that we could learn a lot more about it. But, you know, who's, who's going to undertake that endeavor? That's, if you don't mind me mining that, that, that vein for a moment, um, some of those things that you would like to learn more about ambergris or sperm whales, wh what do you think some of the questions about it remain unanswered? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things I really love about ambergris is that, and, and I think it's one of the things that makes it so difficult to describe, is that it's not just one thing. It's, um, it's, a, it's a bouquet of all these different organic compounds. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, it's the starting point is that sort of when when ambergris first comes out it's sort of black and sticky and and really fecal and uh the first time i held sort of fresh black ambergris in new zealand i, I it was totally obvious obvious to me that this was not vomit and no one could ever mistake it for vomit because it smells like sheep dung it's really it smells like it came straight from a farmer's field so that is definitely one thing but it's nothing like the highest quality, most refined ambergris yeah. that's out there, which is this white aged stuff. And so, um, so really ambergris is a combination of all the different sort of degradation products and different uh, organic components of that journey as it goes from the black stuff to the, to the white stuff. And so, uh, it, I think it's fair to say that every piece of ambergris smells a little different because at any time it is a slightly different thing. And so I would love to know more about that. And, and that kind of work could be done by looking at the different levels of the organic compounds in any one piece of ambergris. Um, someone with the, with the resources and the ambergris and the lab could definitely do that kind of work by doing like, um, HPLC work, you know, look, just sort of taking a very complicated comp uh, like group of compounds, if you like, and sort of teasing it apart to see what it's really made of and the different amounts of each of those chemicals in there. Um, that's, that kind of thing would be fascinating to me because I've, I've held ambergris that smells really sort of almost sweet like vanilla Mm -hmm. um, very, very sort of soft and sweet and pleasant and warm. Um, and I've smelled ambergris that really smells almost briny. Like you can tell that it's from the ocean. It's, uh, it, there's a lot of sort of ozone-y kind of, um, sort of the odor profile of it is, is just totally different. So I would, I would love to know more just from a chemical point of view about why those two pieces differ so completely one and the book is really fun to read um 
you know, it, it's one part sort of this adventure story, right? Told from your perspective, one kind of delving into the history, the science behind it, where it stands today, right? In terms of, kind of the research or the availability. I'm kind of curious, was ambergris, when you, when you finally did smell it, was it as magical as you expected it to be? It, it was, yeah, yes. It was. I just realized that I, I, I made the assumption that you expected it to be magical. That's true. That's true. You caught yourself there. I mean, I, um, I, I didn't want to. I'm sort of a, I'm, I'm a little bit of a pessimist, I think, usually, and a realist, more a realist than a pessimist, expecting, if anything, to be a little disappointed by it. Um, my expectation was that all these people had failed, they weren't good at describing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, ah, I've, got, I've got the adjectives, I'll be able to describe it. But it, it really surprised me how it, it seemed to smell simultaneously of lots and lots of familiar things all sort of jammed together and things that you wouldn't normally maybe maybe put together, you know? Um, but yeah, it really did. I think if I had, the first time that I smelled it, I think if it had been as pedestrian as I expected it might be, then maybe I wouldn't have written the book. Um, it was only that it was so surprising. And I, and I remember I woke up the next morning and I was, the smell of it was sort of still there in my nose. And it really did sort of like, it, it got me. I, I gotta say, I know very little about ambergris. In fact, probably most of what I know of it is either through just individual perfumes that I do own and probably actually reading your book. One of the fun things about the book was sort of the history of ambergris. You know, it, you talk about, you know, trade of ambergris going back to the ninth century at times it being three times more valuable than gold. So besides ambergris being ground up and dissolved for perfume, what have been some of the other uses for ambergris throughout the centuries? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we're so we're talking about a time where, you know, before the, the time of modern medicine, where people would use pretty much anything as medicine. I mean, there was a, there was a time a couple of hundred years ago where um, mummies from Egypt, you know, it was when people were just starting from the West to go into places like Egypt and sort of do all this crazy exploration of the pyramids and finding mummies in there. And they would grind up the mummies. And that would be um, a sort of cure all pretty much. I mean, uh, anyone had any kind of physical complaint, give them some mummy powder, mummy powder and call me in the morning kind of thing. And so, you know, something like ambergris, it sort of becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like, in that it's so rare and strange that it just is valuable. Mm -hmm. you know, just, just on the basis of the fact that it can't easily be found and no one can predict where it will be, that, that is enough to make it rare and unusual. And then if something's rare, then it automatically takes on value. And then if it takes on value, then it's the kind of thing that somebody is going to uh, like, like on his eggs as he did, or, um, you know, people are going to take it as a, as a tincture to cure their toothache or uh, any kind of ailment you could think of. So those kind of things, it was used as a medicine. It was definitely used to scent gloves. If you were the Royals, you know, during the, the Tudor times. Um, and that was because the smell of it is so, sort of tenacious, it really sticks around on things. That's why it's used in perfume in the first place. But it also made the ladies gloves smell really strongly. Um, and back in those times, there was so much pestilence and sort of sewage running through the streets that it was really preferable to have gloves that smelled strongly of whale poop. <laughs> you could, you'd, you'd do that and it would uh, sort of protect you from smelling 
the foul odors that, that surrounded you. So it was used for all kinds of things. You know, one of the things that you did just mention was ambergris and eggs mm. and just ambergris being used as a, a food item. You actually tried a number of these ancient recipes, right? I did. I, oh I felt, my. <laughs> yeah, I felt an obligation to, to do that. Um, Those recipes were so disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you if you look um, if you look at old Tudor cookbooks, most of it is pretty disgusting. You know, they they would love to have a have a jellied pig's foot or a you know a, a pie with forty little baby birds baked into it. I mean, that those kind of recipes really did exist, and so um, yeah, I felt uh, some obligation to do it properly, and mm -hmm. I. I dug out a couple of recipes that I thought would maybe more doable than some of the others. And I, I gave it a try. Not, not good, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When people ask you to tell a story about eating ambergris, is there, is there one anecdote that perhaps stands above all the others for you? Um, well, I think that I tried to grate it over scrambled eggs. Uh, which was the way that Charles II used to enjoy it, apparently. But it would just stuck to my teeth. It was everywhere and uh, and difficult to to sort of digest. And mm -hmm. was like it was like when you have black pepper, like you have a piece of black pepper and you bite it an hour later after you've eaten, and it's just really really peppery. Well, it was like that. I was finding pieces of ambergris in my in my teeth hours later. Uh, not not pleasant, but I wanted to know. Uh, felt like I should, you know, give it a try. Yeah. You know, hey, you're you're a braver man than I. The uh, you know one of the other things that the the book really focuses on, or are your advent adventures out on the beach after a big storm, searching the high tide line. What are the right conditions for finding ambergris? Are there a couple factors, location, time of year, anything yeah. else? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's definitely ways to increase the odds of, of being successful. And I think if you live, do you, do you live on the coast? You live pretty, close. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if, you're, if you live close to a stretch of coastline that you're very familiar with, then you will probably know that there are some beaches or even parts of some beaches that seem to be really productive. It's like they really catch a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of flotsam that, that gets thrown in there and, and left there. And some beaches are just really good for it. Uh -huh. um, those are obviously since... Since ambergris is going to be floating in the ocean, those are the places that you're going to want to look. And so um, after a high tide, obviously, uh, it's like every day you're going to get a whole bunch of fresh stuff dumped on the beach for you to go and pick over. But if there's really big storms, if there's a, you know, if there's a really big weather system that's churning out there and then it just pummels the beach for a couple of days after that that's a really good time to go and have a really thorough search and sort of pick through everything look under lugs for for things that have been sort of lodged yeah those are the those are the sort of conditions that you're really gonna want to spend some time with are, are the are the odds just as good on the Oregon coast as they might be in a place like New Zealand so New Zealand is considered a center for, for ambergris these days. And I think it's just, I mean, you look at a map, you know, New Zealand is this tiny little landmass surrounded by ocean. And the ocean is the kind of ocean that is frequented by sperm whales. And it's just out there in the middle of nowhere. And some of the weather is, um, it's pretty, the, the conditions can be quite harsh. Um, the coastline is very sort of indented. 
uh, and um, so there's lots and lots of coastline and um, and it's very unpopulated too so uh -huh. you know there's a lot of opportunity for people to to be on really remote beaches a lot of the beaches in in uh, western and developed parts of the world are really controlled and man-made and built up and sort of tamed uh -huh. and that's not really true of new zealand it's very wild remote and unpeopled you know i'm curious is in you know feel free to talk me out of this is is ambergris hunting a viable career option for anyone out there it's it's definitely a revenue stream I think a lot of the, so there are definitely professional ambergris hunters mm -hmm. in New Zealand, but I think often they do it in conjunction with something else. So maybe they're a farmer and there are times of the year that are very, very busy for them. And then there are times that are slightly less busy where they could go out every day and look for ambergris. So mm -hmm. um, the, the way that someone put it to me when I was, I was trying to find sources to talk with me about that kind of thing for the book and the way that, that a few people put it to me was it's not enough to live on, but it's enough to buy yourself the family holiday uh -huh. every year, or it's enough to maybe buy yourself a new car um, that kind of thing, you know? So it's, it can be in a good year, it can be a really good solid source of revenue. Um, and if you're, if you're a, you know, a spendthrift, maybe it's enough to live on. <laughs> it was interesting, you know, a number of the, the, what I would consider to be characters mm -hmm. uh, that you met profiled in the book who were ambergris hunters, right? Either, you know, in their spare time, or I guess in some cases it seemed like, right, it was their full-time job. Yeah. W were there a couple kind of defining characteristics that that you saw amongst that very small group of ambergris hunters? Mm. It's a good question. I mean, Kiwis in general, New, New Zealanders are a particular bunch. They're... they're they're really hardy. They're really tough. Um, they don't say much. Um, it took us a while when we first moved there to really get used to, to Kiwis. I mean, that we, uh, I remember I worked with someone who, who said, Oh, I can't stand Americans. They, they just talk too much. All they ever do is talk, talk, talk. And I said, well, what can you, can you give me an example? And she'd recently been to a scientific conference. Um, I think it was in Seattle. And at the airport, she was a tiny, tiny woman. At the airport, she was trying to get her bag off the baggage carousel. And it was as big as her and she was struggling. And an American had said, can I help you with that? And that was the too much talking. <laughs> oh my God, for shame. Exactly. <laughs> all the time offering to help me with my bag when I didn't even need help. And so they're, they're a real, um, they're a real interesting bunch of people. I mean, they, many of them, especially where we were down in Dunedin, it, it was, um, it was settled by the Scots, mm -hmm. um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And they settled there because it looks like Scotland. And just like the Scottish people, they're sort of quiet and um, and rough, you know, close to the land. A rugged so, stoicism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the kind of stoicism that allows you to like there were there were some beaches that we wanted to visit, and it was a three day walk just to get in there. And there's no other way to get in there. So you know, we, we had a baby at that time, so we didn't do it. It was just uh -huh. practical, but it's the kind of thing that a Kiwi would do. And so I think that in answer to the question, what are the characteristics of these people? I think that 
the entire population has the characteristics that make them really great ambergris hunters. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're happy with a little discomfort. They don't notice rain and um, they're, they're a tough bunch. You know, obviously like you had, you had talked about a lot of your experience with ambergris hunters, dealers was in New Zealand. Are there other kind of like big kind of like places where ambergris is typically found or bought and sold uh, other places on the globe that you either had an opportunity to go to or had wished you had? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, a lot of places that you can, you know, the same conditions, small places in the middle of the ocean, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, so the Maldives, the Philippines, um, places like that seem to be really good sources of, of ambergris. And I would love to have gone to those places. Um, I have been to the Philippines and, you know, we, you, that, that's a great example. You're talking about almost 4,000 islands mm-hmm. in, the, in the ocean. So that would be a good source. Um, it, in the years since, um, since the book was published, I think not a week has really gone by without me being contacted by someone from India or the United Arab Emirates or Dubai or somewhere like that, saying that they either want some ambergris or that they've got some to sell me. (laughs) And so just by anecdotal uh, history over the last few years, I would say that those are those places are in the marketplace. Another thing that you, at least that I took away from the book was the, the veil of secrecy that seems to really exist around the buying and selling, the hunting of ambergris. Uh, it, it seemed like you had a real hard time getting people to talk to you. And when they did, they were pretty guarded. And w- what were some of the reasons why that was the case. Yeah, uh, it definitely was the case. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One, I, maybe the most obvious one is that it's it's a big source of revenue for whoever that person is. I mean, it was in most cases, it was ambergris hunters or dealers I was trying to connect with. Uh-huh. And that would be like, someone maybe finding a a gold field during the gold rush and then me coming along and asking them where's that gold field you were talking about and so they're just trying to protect their interests Mm -hmm. i think um add into that the aspects of whether or not it's legal um you I, I began quickly to understand that there's really sort of sensible reasons why they might not be shouting about ambergris. Uh-huh. Um, so in some countries, it's just prohibited to, to deal in it at all, whether or not those laws are well enforced. But, uh, but yeah, you could, I can understand why they wouldn't really want to be talking with people about it. And I also imagine that they're probably not filing taxes <laughs> on these on the ambergris that they're buying and selling. They're probably not keeping good paperwork, uh-huh. you know? So yeah, there's, there's good reasons to, to not shout about that kind of stuff too much. You, you actually talked about, there's not a week that goes by where you're not contacted by someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's exactly how I got a hold of you, right? On the book jacket, I should at least show this once, right? Floating gold here. On the book jacket, it, in, it lists an email address in the back here. He can be reached at ambergreeshotline at gmail.com. I'm kind of curious about some of the messages that you've received. Are there any any stories that uh, um, that that stick out in your mind in the in the eight years that eight plus years that this address has existed? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a few. There have been a couple of situations where I've 
gut people to send me samples of something because mm -hmm. what happens is people will just find some object they'll be convinced that it's ambergris they'll get on the internet and they'll find that address and um they'll start sending me pictures of it and there was a guy um i'm not going to say where he was from or, or his name because i think in the end by the end of all this many 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 emails he was quite annoyed at me so uh, so i'll leave any identifiers out but he was he sent me a picture of something that looked disgusting totally horrible some random object that had been washed ashore maybe a dead sheep i don't know but um i was just thinking that <laughs> I think it may have been a carcass of something. So I happened to be at work and I got the email and I looked at it and it was, it was horrible. And so I wrote back immediately and I said, don't even touch that. I, I don't know what it is, but I know that it's not ambergris. I can tell you. And then an hour later, he sent me another picture of it. And this time it was on a newspaper in his living room at home. And he was like, are you sure it's not ambergris? And uh, and it was just sort of leaking all over his furniture. And so, so that was one I, I really remember. There was another one. Um, it was one of the more reported on findings, findings of ambergris. I think the, there was a guy in England who'd found a big piece and it was going to change his life. And so I was actually sent a piece of that where I was able to sort of open the envelope up and determine whether or not it was ambergris. That was a pretty um, memorable one. But uh, yeah, I mean, I get them every week. Mm -hmm. And that's why I put the email address on, on the book. I, I obviously didn't want to share my personal email address, but I definitely wanted it to spark a conversation between me and people who were interested and people who struggled as much as I had to try to identify ambergris. Mm -hmm. So it's been, I, I have no regrets about putting that email address on there. You know, thousands of emails later, it has been a source of um, enjoyment and fun and surprise. Yeah, it, it seems like with it, so much secrecy and kind of a lack of really available resources that perhaps some people are looking to you as the de facto expert in everything to do with ambergris. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I don't mind that because I don't, I mean, I think that almost any other person sort of in that chain, in the sort of worldwide market of ambergris, anyone else I can think of does have some vested interest in it. Yeah. I don't have any, any interest in it apart from that I am interested in things. And so, um, you know, if somebody emails me with a picture of something, I don't even mind if it is ambergris or not. So I'll tell you the truth. Um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that somebody has found something valuable. It happens. I mean, I don't know if it's ever actually happened that, that I've opened up a, a photo in an email and said, I think they've got it. It's normally some weird bright yellow stuff um that i've got no idea what it is and my only advice to them is don't touch that <laughs> don't put it in a newspaper and take it home but um do not grate this over eggs yeah well i mean you can always try and do that you never know you never know it could be good i mean a lot of the stuff that people do find and that they think is ambergris is probably some kind of animal fat mm -hmm or palm oil or something like that. And so nine times out of 10, you grate it on eggs, it'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> so uh, clearly I come at this from a you know perspective as someone that loves perfume. And I, I'm curious as to what your experience was in, I guess the writing of the book uh, related to perfumes. Did you discover um, any any uh, commercially available releases that uh, really spoke to you? I, yes, I have one. I, am I able to talk about perfumes? 
That, oh. Of course, of course. Yes, please, please. I mean, I mean, I mean specific perfumes. I, 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 I don't know if I'm able to sort of plug someone's perfume. I'm nobody. Of course. <laughs> We're all nobodies. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so that's one of the really interesting things about, about sort of the whole subject of ambergris. Mm-hmm. Is, and I've been asked this before, and I don't know that I have a satisfactory answer, but is it still used in perfume? You know, the synthetic compounds exist now. So, uh, so there's no reason for people to use it in perfume. But the synthetic compounds, they don't really get at the fragrance the, because of that bouquet of organic compounds. They're just this one thing, and it's just... It's not convincing to Uh me. And in talking with people like the Ambergris Trader, who I talk with in the book, Bernard Perrin, uh, it's obvious that he is flying all over the world to buy enormous boulders of Ambergris and sell it to the French perfumers. So that's going somewhere. Sure. Um, So that's what I would always say, that it, it is somewhere in perfume. But I have a perfume by an American perfumer called Barbara Herman. And the perfume is called MXXX. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, And um, I bought it for my wife as um, a gift, like a birthday or an anniversary. I can't remember what, what the specifics of what I bought it for, but it is just mind blowingly powerful, sort of shimmery, everything that you would expect it to be. It's got sort of like these dark kind of undertones. It, it sort of underpins everything about the fragrance. And, you know, during, during COVID times, it's been hard to, for her to find an excuse to put it on mm-hmm. because we don't go anywhere or do anything. And it's one of those things that you don't want to be wasteful because it's, it's not cheap. Um, and it's finite, you know, you've got this one bottle of it, so you tr- just try and sort of preserve it. But sometimes she just says, well, what the heck? And she'll, she'll spray a bit on. And the other day, a couple of days ago, I was walking my dog in the morning. And as soon as I walked into the house, I could tell that she had sprayed it on um, because it, I could, from, you know, from my back door at the bottom of the stairs, it was just like this cloud that I walked into. Um, and it's a really, really powerful, powerful smell. A beautiful, beautiful fragrance. Excellent. I, we've actually got a store here in Portland that carries uh, Barbara's line. I know I've smelled it. I may have a sample, yeah. but I'll, 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 I'll dig through the, the box later. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I do think that, you know, to some extent, when we um, when we stop using a particular thing, there's this sort of correction in our culture where we all just get used to, um, you know, that particular thing mm-hmm. without that particular component. So, you know, ambergris used to be used widely in many, many perfumes. Now it's probably not used very widely. So now we've just got this new idea of what perfume smells like um but then you do smell one that has ambergris in it and then it's like that's what perfume should smell like i 100 percent agree i you know and i've got like you know some ambroxan just pure ambroxan and look it, it is pleasant i really appreciated how your book kind of broke down that difference between right that that one chemical component that yeah. is ambergris yeah and the real stuff. Yeah. And there really is, at least for me, there's no comparison. No, no. I mean, it's like um, my kids uh, are real candy connoisseurs. They are the, the experts of candy. And it's like that, that banana, that sort of fake banana flavor, Laffy Taffy banana or something like that. It's like comparing that to banana Uh i mean you could see you can sort of it it would be like or i remember uh, being in vietnam 
I was, um, I remember seeing a street artist painting Starry Night by Van Gogh, but he was painting like four of them at once, big canvases, and he was doing that very familiar sort of shape. And he was going to sell them to tourists for 50 bucks a pop. And he probably paints a hundred of them a day and it's beautiful, but it's just this approximation of the, of the original Van Gogh. And, and you can sort of trick your eyes a little bit, but you know, it's not the real, you know, it's not the authentic thing. Yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of where we are with those synthetic compounds. They get the job done, but, um, but they're just not totally convincing. Mm-hmm. So obviously I came to the book a little late. I think it's pushing almost 10 years now, right? I think so, yeah. Oh my God, I know. Shame on me. (laughs) For you, it published in right 2011, I think. What has changed between um, uh, now and then in, I suppose, the world of ambergris, uh, the world of perfume, maybe even just in your world? In my world, um, when I was writing that, I, I think when I started writing it, I had no kids. And then as I was researching it, it was really a nice way to get out there in the world with my baby looking for ambergris. Now that the baby is, um, I'm gonna have to teach him how to shave soon. And I've got, to to other kids so life is busy um in the world of ambergris i think that i i did what i had had intended to do which was i filled a gap in in the knowledge and so i was proud of doing that but now you know sometimes i make the mistake of of reading reviews or someone will sit will send me an email to tell me what they thought of the book Mm -hmm. and Often people are very nice and, and friendly and, um, and say nice things about it. But sometimes people will say, I didn't learn anything in this book that isn't already out on the internet. And I just think, well, that's because it was in the book. You know, it becomes a sort of cycle where there was no information or the information was sort of really esoteric and difficult to find. So I found it and now it's way more available. Technically, there's no need for the book anymore you know Mm -hmm. so I I filled that gap and and that's that's what I intended to do so um, I'm quite happy for it to be filled well well, I would certainly disagree that you know bought a copy I learned a lot it has a place it certainly has a place I think on any perfume lover's bookshelf and look I'm a nerd I love books Clearly, I love perfume as well. So these two, it's like two great tastes that go great together. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. All right. Take care. All the best to your family. Yeah, you too. Yeah.